And I'm not saying that it was false pretense that got me here, but, you know, we're talking, you know, they said, oh, come on, we're going to celebrate the 125th anniversary. So naturally, I thought they were talking about me. <laughs> I mean, the number isn't quite right. I've been at the paper a little longer than that, but still, <laughs> I thought, I thought, you know, this was this announced something completely different. And although I think you noticed with the early people telling the stories that there's there's if there was a if there's a recurring theme that I picked up when I was listening to these guys talk about things, it is that when you work in journalism, there's an element of being haunted by your stories. Um, I think all of us feel that in one way or another, and. That's a little bit what I'm here to tell you about. Because I think that if you've been a journalist for a long enough time, like just this morning, I got a call from a ghost. <laughs> I get a call from this particular ghost pretty much every day. There were three on my phone this morning. If you're a journalist, you're, you're going to make the acquaintance of ghosts. And I've been writing newspaper columns for a long time, and I've made the acquaintance of many ghosts. They come in all kinds of different categories. There are revered ghosts, like the police or the or, or uh, soldiers who are lost in the line of duty. There are reluctant ghosts, They're like people who are killed in tragic circumstance or who die by illness or something like that. There are accidental ghosts. There are intentional ghosts. There are familiar ghosts, like um, some of our friends and colleagues who have died or our family members. And then, though, there's this category that I was completely surprised by, I didn't quite understand until I got the job that I have now, and that is living ghosts. Like the person I'm going to tell you about, whose name is Gracie. Gracie left her first message for me on my telephone answering machine more than 20 years ago. And just about every day since then, she's left at least one and sometimes two or three or ten on my machine. And she's written me letters, many, many letters. And it's interesting, what I've learned, what I feel I've learned from all that correspondence and all those messages is that the world we live in, it's really not a very kind place for a living ghost. It made me think that, well, Maybe that's why the ghosts who have passed on choose to remain invisible to us. I have with me a couple of Gracie's letters, actually, I brought them with me because I wanted to share just a few things from them. They go on and on and on. This one begins, and I have a little part of it here. It begins, Hello, my special, kind, understanding, wonderful, caring, loving, admirable, adorable, compassionate, patient, beautiful inside and out, big, strong, handsome, E.J. Montini friend. <laughs> Gracie is a very discerning ghost. <laughs> but she's also a frightened one. She believes that the police and other government agencies are out to get her. She's convinced that they have kidnapped a bunch of innocent people and are holding them, and they want to put her away because she knows, she knows about their scheme. She has said to me on, the, on some of the messages that my voice on my answering machine protects her. This is why she usually calls me really late at night or really early in the morning when I'm probably not going to be there. On those rare occasions when she calls during the day and I pick up the phone, it, she will hang up right away. Or she will say, thank you for letting me call and apologize and then hang up and then call me right back. Because she doesn't want to talk to me. It's my voice on the phone that protects her. A couple years back, I went away on a vacation. And naturally, I just ignored everything that had to do with work. And when I came back, my voice messaging machine was filled. And I also had an anxious letter from Gracie, which is this one here, it goes on and on. And there was this one little part in it. It said, she says, she sort of whispers when she talks. Her messages, they have a sort of a throaty, whispery kind of quality. She says, I want to make sure you knew it wasn't me who called you too many times, leaving you too many messages. You know, I've been talking to you on your machine, but you can't hear me because it says, sorry, you cannot leave a message now because this user's mailbox is full. 
So since then, I clean out my voice message you know, every day. <laughs> Whether I'm on vacation or not, I'll call in and clean it out. You know, it's, it's a very interesting thing. I've told, I've told the, the, the people here, that my employers, I said, you know, if I, you know, quit or get fired or get laid off or die or something like that, I'd like it very much if you could just keep the message, my message machine on. <laughs> At least for a while, maybe have an intern come around every now and then and clear it out, you know, for me, because that way, that way, Gracie would never have to hear someone say this user's mailbox is full. It just, it just doesn't seem right to me in that context. It's a funny thing, you know. You, you, you when you have a job like mine, I've probably written thousands of newspaper columns. I would imagine I've like. Um, a few of them. <laughs> One. <laughs> but I don't honestly, I don't honestly consider any of them to be more important than this. I look at my job. My job is contractual. You know, I write the articles, the newspaper pays me, much to the chagrin of a certain element of our community. <laughs> And much to the complete astonishment of most of my friends and relatives. <laughs> this, however, is something uh, completely different. I have had friends who have sat next to me near work and they say, it must be a real hassle having to deal with this person that calls you all the time, you know? I mean, it's because there are almost everybody who was sitting next to me knows pretty much about this person. And I said that over time, I've come to think of it as Honestly, it's just the opposite of that. It's like, I don't think of Gracie as a burden. I think of her as a gift. Think about it. I mean, she asks for my protection, right? Well, she seeks it. She seeks my protection. But she doesn't ask for my money. She doesn't ask for my time. She doesn't ask for my professional assistance or anything like that. All she asks for is a voice on an answering machine. I figure, you know, if I can do that one thing for this one ghost in this one lifetime, you know, maybe Gracie and the other ghosts will look after me in the next. Thank you.